Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 30 Dennis had been called, but in spite of the parted curtains he dropped off again into that drowsy, dozy state when sleep becomes a sensual pleasure almost consciously savoured. In this condition he might have remained for another hour if he had not been disturbed by a violent rapping at the door. "'Come in,' he mumbled, without opening his eyes. The latch clicked, a hand seized him by the shoulder, and he was rudely shaken. "'Get up, get up!' His eyelids blinked painfully apart, and he saw Mary standing over him, bright-faced and earnest. "'Get up,' she repeated. "'You must go and send the telegram. Don't you remember?' "'Oh, Lord!' he threw off the bedclothes. His tormentor retired. Dennis dressed as quickly as he could, and ran up the road to the village post-office. Satisfaction glowed within him as he returned. He had sent a long telegram, which would, in a few hours, evoke an answer ordering him back to town at once on urgent business. It was an act performed, a decisive step taken, and he so rarely took decisive steps, he felt pleased with himself. It was with a whetted appetite that he came into breakfast. "'Good morning,' said Mr. Scogan. "'I hope you're better.' "'Better? You were rather worried about the cosmos last night.' Dennis tried to laugh away the impeachment. "'Was I?' he lightly asked. "'I wish,' said Mr. Scogan, "'that I had nothing worse to prey on my mind. "'I should be a happy man.' "'One is only happy in action,' Dennis enunciated, "'thinking of the telegram. "'He looked out of the window. "'Great, florid, baroque clouds "'floating high in the blue heaven. "'A wind stirred among the trees, "'and their shaken foliage twinkled and glittered "'like metal in the sun.' Everything seemed marvellously beautiful. At the thought that he would soon be leaving all this beauty, he felt a momentary pang, but he comforted himself by recollecting how decisively he was acting. Action, he repeated aloud, and going over to the sideboard, he helped himself to an agreeable mixture of bacon and fish. Breakfast over, Dennis repaired to the terrace, and, sitting there, raised the enormous bulwark of the times against the possible assaults of Mr. Scogan, who showed an unappeased desire to go on talking about the universe. Secure behind the crackling pages, he meditated. In the light of this brilliant morning, the emotions of last night seemed somehow rather remote. And what if he had seen them embracing in the moonlight? Perhaps it didn't mean much after all. And, even if it did, why shouldn't he stay? He felt strong enough to stay, strong enough to be aloof, disinterested, a mere friendly acquaintance, even if he weren't strong enough. "'What time do you think the telegram will arrive?' asked Mary, suddenly, thrusting in upon him over the top of the paper. Dennis started guiltily. "'I don't know at all,' he said. "'I was only wondering,' said Mary, "'because there's a very good train at 3.27, and it would be nice if you could catch it, wouldn't it?' "'Awfully nice,' he agreed weakly. He felt as though he were making arrangements for his own funeral. Train leaves Waterloo, 3.27. No flowers. Mary was gone. No, he was blowed if he had let himself be hurried down to the necropolis like this. He was blowed. The sight of Mr. Scogan looking out with a hungry expression from the drawing-room window made him precipitately hoist the times once more. For a long while he kept it hoisted. Lowering it at last to take another cautious peep at his surroundings, he found himself, with what astonishment, confronted by Anne's faint, amused, malicious smile. She was standing before him, the woman who was a tree. The swaying grace of her movement arrested in a pose that seemed itself a movement. "'How long have you been standing there?' he asked, when he had done gaping at her. "'Oh, about half an hour, I suppose,' she said airily. You are so very deep in your paper. Head over ears. I didn't like to disturb you. You look lovely this morning, Dennis exclaimed. It was the first time he had ever had the courage to utter a personal remark of the kind. Anne held up her hand as though to ward off a blow. Don't bludgeon me, please. She sat down on the bench beside him. He was a nice boy, she thought, quite charming, and Gombold's violent insistences were really becoming rather tiresome. "'Why don't you wear white trousers?' she asked. "'I like you so much in white trousers.' "'They're at the wash,' Dennis replied rather curtly. "'This white trouser business was all in the wrong spirit. "'He was just preparing a scheme to manoeuvre the conversation back to the proper path, 
when Mr. Scogan suddenly darted out of the house, crossed the terrace with clockwork rapidity, and came to a halt in front of the bench on which they were seated. To go on with our interesting conversation about the cosmos, he began, I become more and more convinced that the various parts of the concern are fundamentally discreet. But would you mind, Dennis, moving a shade to your right? He wedged himself between them on the bench. And if you would shift a few inches to the left, my dear Anne, thank you. Discreet, I think, was what I was saying. You were, said Anne. Dennis was speechless. They were taking their afternoon lunch and coffee in the library when the telegram arrived. Dennis blushed guiltily as he took the orange envelope from the salver and tore it open. Return at once. Urgent family business. It was too ridiculous, as if he had any family business. Wouldn't it be best just to crumple the thing and put it in his pocket without saying anything about it? He looked up. Mary's large blue china eyes were fixed upon him, seriously, penetratingly. He blushed more deeply than ever, hesitated in a horrible uncertainty. "'What's your telegram about?' Mary asked significantly. He lost his head. "'I'm afraid,' he mumbled, "'I'm afraid this means I shall have to go back to town at once.' He frowned at the telegram ferociously. "'But that's absurd, impossible,' cried Anne. She had been standing by the window talking to Gombold, but at Dennis's words she came swaying across the room towards him. "'It's urgent,' he repeated desperately. "'But you've only been here such a short time,' Anne protested. "'I know,' he said, utterly miserable. "'Oh, if only she could understand women were supposed to have intuition.' "'If he must go, he must,' put in Mary firmly. "'Yes, I must.' He looked at the telegram again for inspiration. "'You see, it's urgent family business,' he explained. Priscilla got up from her chair in some excitement. "'I had a distinct presentiment of this last night,' she said. "'A distinct presentiment.' "'A mere coincidence, no doubt,' said Mary, brushing Mrs. Wimbush out of the conversation. "'There's a very good train at 3.27.' She looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'You'll have nice time to pack.' "'I'll order the motor at once.' Henry Wimbush rang the bell. The funeral was well under way. It was awful, awful. "'I'm wretched you should be going,' said Anne. Dennis turned towards her. She really did look wretched. He abandoned himself hopelessly fantastically to his destiny. This was what came of action, of doing something decisive. If only he had just let things drift, if only. "'I shall miss your conversation,' said Mr. Scogan. Mary looked at the clock again. "'I think perhaps you ought to go and pack,' she said. Obediently, Dennis left the room. Never again, he said to himself, never again would he do anything decisive. Hamlet, West Bowlby, Nipswich for Timberney, Spavin Delaware, and then all the other stations, and then, finally, London. The thought of the journey appalled him. And what on earth was he going to do in London when he got there? He climbed wearily up the stairs. It was time for him to lay himself in his coffin. The car was at the door, the hearse. The whole party had assembled to see him go. Goodbye, goodbye. Mechanically he tapped the barometer that hung in the porch. The needle stirred perceptibly to the left. A sudden smile lighted up his lugubrious face. "'It sinks, and I am ready to depart,' he said, quoting Landor with an exquisite aptness. He looked quickly round from face to face. Nobody had noticed. He climbed into the hearse. End of recording.